Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back or welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I upload true crime videos like this one every Sunday, although sometimes also on other days of the week too. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and tick that little bell so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at a case that honestly, when I first started researching it, it made my jaw drop. I'm sure you can see by the title of this episode just how wild the trial in this case is. So without further ado, let's take a look at the case of Harry and Nicola Fuller. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve deep into this case, I'd just like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. I'm sure you've heard of Magellan TV before, especially on my channel, and it's not without good reason. Magellan TV is my absolute go-to for all of my documentary needs. With a wide range of documentaries from space, nature to true crime, and with 4K at no extra cost, it's the perfect place to wind down after a long day while still learning something new. Magellan TV actually adds between 15 to 20 hours of brand new content every single week, so if you're worried about running out of true crime content to watch, worry no more. I've just watched Agatha Christie Code, which is a documentary that explores and dives deep into the inner workings of Agatha Christie. What makes Agatha Christie such a successful writer? On the 75th anniversary of the creation of her immortal character, Miss Marple, this documentary attempts to answer the question using sophisticated computer analyses of Christie's every written word, her sentence structure, story arcs, poisons used, red herrings, clues, and more. Be sure to use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments and use your one month free trial to go watch Agatha Christie Code and once you've finished it, dive deep into Magellan TV's extensive true crime collection. As I said before, new documentaries like Agatha Christie Code are added to Magellan TV weekly, so do not sleep on your offer. Grab your one month free trial using the links below and thank you to Magellan TV for constantly supporting this channel and making content like this video possible. Now, back to the case. Nicola Barbara Johnson was born on the 27th of July 1965 in Tonbridge, Kent, England, to parents Michael and Barbara Johnson. Not too long after Nicola was brought into the world, her parents had a second child called Michelle, giving Nicola a younger sister. Now, not all too much is known about Nicola's upbringing, but what we do know is that she was described as, quote, an English rose, very unassuming and very quiet. Her family further described her as being a, quote, private, dainty little girl. Nicola actually obtained a business studies qualification in Tunbridge in her early adulthood, and through her 20s, she held down regular jobs to keep money coming in. It appeared she had her life on track. Everything seemed to be going well for Nicola, and her life was about to change for the better when, in June of 1992, Nicola's little sister Michelle got married. And Michelle's new husband had a friend that Michelle wanted her sister to meet, and so Nicola was introduced to a man called Harry Fuller. Harry Fuller had been born on the 31st of August 1947, also in Tonbridge, Kent, England. As with Nicola, we don't know that much about Harry as a teenager or really as a young adult, though he would be described in local newspapers later on as, quote, a car dealer who also had interests in the building trade and in the property business. Further accounts of Harry would later detail the 45-year-old as being a shady wheeler dealer, a wealthy rogue, a flyboy, and a conman. Harry had been described as being promiscuous, citing his long history of relationships with other women. He had two ex-wives before he had met Nicola, and a string of girlfriends in between them. Harry had actually had a child with one of his previous ex-wives, and this ex-wife was called Elizabeth, and they lived nearby. It's important to note that we were unable to find the existence of Harry's first wife in the official records, so we're unsure of when the marriage had happened or if it had even happened to begin with. Elizabeth and Harry had moved together to Crowborough after the storm of 1987 swept through the area, causing destruction. The couple's neighbours would later recount their experience of Harry by saying, quote, Harry offered to replace six slates blown off my roof and charged me £200 for it. 
I was a bit frightened of him, so I paid up. Then he dug up my front path, saying he smelt gas and there must be a leak. He went around on his hands and knees with a lighted match, found nothing, and then charged me to relay the path. Another neighbour described a time that Harry had been asked to repair a chimney for them. Quote, he got up there with a sledgehammer and the whole lot came through my porch and left a big hole in the top of my house. There was nothing I could do because he made me pay £800 by cheque before he did the job. He was a big bloke and I found him a bit intimidating. He was always banging about with cars. At the time, he was driving a Porsche, and there were always cars lined up in the streets. I don't know much about him other than that. The police came round once or twice. Harry was described as being somebody who was larger than life, and definitely somebody that you'd remember. Though he was also somebody that made enemies. One account details of how he had been dangled by his ankles from a balcony in Woolwich, London, before his Porsche was driven into the Thames. The marriage between Elizabeth and Harry hadn't been one that was destined to last, with the couple divorcing not long after the birth of their first and only child. And as we know, in June of 1992, Harry and Nicola were introduced to one another by Nicola's sister Michelle, marrying one another in August of that same year. This whirlwind romance was described by her family as being a roller coaster, rather quick. Nicholas' father Michael, when asked about this, said, quote, Once it started, there was no way of stopping it. We grew to like him very much. He used to come here for Sunday lunch most weekends. Harry very quickly became a popular member of the family. Nicola and Harry moved to Wadhurst, Sussex in the October of 1992, soon after their wedding, and rented a property called Blackman's Cottage. It was the perfect property for the newlyweds, especially as there had been a free car parking lot, which meant that Harry could park all the cars he wanted there. He was always buying cars and looking for somewhere to store them, so it was great for him. Despite Harry being unable to confidently read or write, on part due to his dyslexia, his business dealings after he moved to Wadhurst with Nicola were bustling. Most of his business was conducted over the phone, and his transactions were always conducted in cash, which meant that he oftentimes carried a lot of cash with him. Nicola's family saw Harry as coming from a different way of life than them, but they were happy that he had been able to bring Nicola out of her shell, and she evidently enjoyed her life with him. Harry was protective over Nicola, and he always brought her flowers, which she displayed all over the couple's cottage. Nicola had also found part-time work at a job in Tunbridge Wells, which she enjoyed. As February of 1993 came around, the couple decided to book a holiday together to Lanzarote during the week commencing February 15th, and they were both super excited to go on this much welcome break away. Nicola was also excited to go on this holiday so she could get a nice suntan before the summer months rolled around. It's important to note that in early February, Harry decided to start recording his phone calls, which included any inbound and outbound calls at the couple's cottage. Why exactly, it's not clear, but this decision would play a critical role in this case. Tuesday the 9th of February 1993 was a cold day, as the people of Wadhurst said their last goodbyes to the winter weathers before starting to welcome the summer sun. Nicola had gone to work in Tunbridge Wells that day as she had always done. Harry had spent the early part of the afternoon that Tuesday with a friend that he'd known for around 13 years. You see, his friend had asked Harry to help him buy a new car at a local auction, and Harry jumped at the opportunity. He had helped his friend buy a car previously, and so was excited to kit his friend out with the latest bells and whistles out of steel of a price. Both Nicola and Harry returned to their cottage in the early evening, and Nicola began to get herself ready to go out with some friends to go to a reunion at a restaurant in Tunbridge Wells that was due to start between 7 and 8 p.m. that night. Harry arranged with Nicola to pick her up from the restaurant at about 11 p.m. that night. Now, not long after Nicola had left for the reunion, Harry received a phone call from an unidentified caller on the cottage's landline phone. And due to the fact that Harry had been recording his calls, again, we're not quite sure why, an audio recording of this call exists. Let's take a listen to this call. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better. I popped over last night to see you. What time? About seven. I was up the gym, up at the um, golf club. 
at Tysus. There's some lights on, but I'm not. Right. See you in the morning, my darling. Hey, Eight o'clock. Yeah. Bye. Despite Harry actually being a late riser, he arranged with this unknown man on the phone to meet early the next morning. This was very unlike Harry. He was the kind of person that appreciated the comforts of his bed into the late morning. Regardless, he went to pick up Nicola as agreed and the couple both returned back to their cottage. Wednesday the 10th of February 1993, at 6.30am, a postman delivering the mail on the couple's street was suddenly startled by a car pulling out from behind Nicola and Harry's cottage. This was very out of the ordinary to the postman, as it was usually very quiet on the road at that time. The car that had so suddenly pulled out had been a dirty Ford Escort, and fortunately the postman managed to get a good look at a passenger that was in the car. He described this passenger as appearing to be between 35 to 40 years old, tall and well built, though he only saw this passenger for a few moments before the vehicle drove off down the road towards Tumblr Brails. At 7.05am, an anonymous witness saw two men get out of a cream-coloured Sierra and walk up the path to the cottage and enter. Now importantly, nobody saw the two men leave the property. About 55 minutes later, just after 8am, another witness reported seeing a long black bonneted vehicle, possibly a Jaguar, pull into the car park behind the couple's cottage, and they saw a man wearing a long black coat that was almost to the floor get out of the car and walk in the direction of Blackman's cottage. At around 8.30am, not half an hour later, Harry left the cottage with the front door to the property ajar. At 8.33am, Harry was caught on CCTV, going into the local tobacconist to pick up some cigarettes, after which he returned back to the cottage at about 8.35am. Half an hour prior, at 8am, Nicola's mother had tried ringing Nicola as she hadn't heard from her since the previous Sunday, and she'd known about the reunion she'd gone to and wanted to catch up. When Nicola's mother had tried to ring the cottage's landline at 8am that morning, the line had been engaged, and so Nicola's mother continued to try to ring Nicola every 5 minutes until 9.15am. At 8.43am that morning, not 10 minutes after Harry had returned to the cottage after purchasing some cigarettes, a 999 call to emergency services was placed from the couple's landline phone. It would later be determined that this phone call had been made by Nicola, and that she, at that point, had been severely wounded. By the time that call was placed, Harry had already died. Both Nicola and Harry had been shot. You know, she just seems to have found happiness and then suddenly snatched away from her, which seems dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Anyone could do that to her. I feel that this part of me has gone and there is this big hole that's never going to be filled and I do miss her so. Nicola was unable to communicate with the 999 emergency services operator due to the fact that her jaw had been shattered by a gunshot wound. The operator, upon answering the call, believed that there had been a child on the other end of the line so asked Nicola, who, as we said, couldn't communicate with them, is mummy there? 17 seconds into the call with emergency services, the operator heard a scream followed by the sound of a shot. This was the sound of the final shot in the horrific attack on the couple, and it had been fired through a duvet to muffle it at Nicola. The call itself with 999 continued on for five and a half more minutes, in which you can hear the sound of footsteps and the sound of the opening and closing of drawers. It's important to note the sheer effort required for Nicola to get to the phone with the injuries that she had sustained to place the call to emergency services. I think the, the nightmares that you have are of the fact that somebody desperately need, needs help. I know that she crawled a long way, she got to a phone, she managed to dial 999 and nobody came. And that keeps you awake at three o'clock in the morning. 
night after night. After Nicola's parents had been unable to make contact with her that morning, they decided to try and contact her place of work to see if she'd been there. Maybe the couple's landline wasn't working properly or something like that. Though when they spoke with Nicola's manager, they were told something that made their hearts sink into their stomachs. Nicola hadn't shown up for work that morning. That was extremely out of character for her, especially without telling anyone why she couldn't get to work or, you know, just giving any reasons why. At around 7 to 8 p.m. that evening, Nicola's parents, who had still been unable to make contact with her, decided to contact the local authorities, who subsequently dispatched two officers to the cottage. The officers met Nicola's parents at the cottage to find both the front and back doors to be locked. Nicola's parents then informed the officers that Harry kept large sums of money in the house due to the nature of his job, and that the couple's cars were still parked at the property. After a bit of back and forth between the officers and Nicola's parents, and after Nicola's father gave his permission, the two officers broke down the front door to the property in order to gain access to the house. As they entered the cottage, the eerie silence was immediately noticeable, and it was unnerving. And Nicola's parents knew at that very moment that something had been very, very wrong. The officers searched the cottage and tragically, they found both Harry and Nicola murdered inside. Harry's body had been found to have a white substance scattered on it, which the investigators believed was intended to make it seem as if the killings had been drug related. This powder was sent to be analysed and it was identified to have actually been sucrose and not some kind of illegal substance. The investigators determined that five shots total had been fired during the murders, though they had only been able to locate two cases within the cottage, which was indicative of the fact that the killer or the killers had collected any cases that they had found. One of the two cases that the authorities had located had been found in Nicola's dressing gown, and it was found to have come from the gunshots that had ultimately killed her, with the second of the two cases being found underneath Harry's body. As we mentioned, both the front and back doors to the cottage were locked and secured, with no signs of forced entry, which, as I'm sure you've deduced, is indicative of the fact that the killer or killers had been invited into the couple's cottage and likely knew them. Harry's body had been found in the downstairs of the house, and he had sustained a singular shot through the heart, which had killed him. And Nicola had been found upstairs in the property and she had sustained four gunshot wounds. The police launched an extensive investigation following the murders. Detectives delved into the background of Harry Fuller and explored the relationships he had with numerous people in an effort to try and find any kind of motive for the senseless murders. From these inquiries, it became clear to the authorities that Harry had been a man who had been involved, as we mentioned earlier on, in what the detectives described as enterprises on the edge of legality, and that he had connections to people who were involved in even more serious criminal activities. They initially speculated that the murders of the Fuller couple had been related to something in the criminal underworld. It was clear to the investigators that a number of people had clear grudges against Harry. This was because Harry was likely seen as a, quote, grass by some criminals due to him giving information to the authorities in relation to his car sales business, aka he was a part-time police informant. In fact, five days before the murders, Harry had actually told a detective that he had been having trouble with a man who we'll call Jonathan to protect their identity due to an allegation that Harry had been, quote, grassing and car ringing, which was an allegation stemming from late 1992. The police actually spoke with a witness who had been told by Harry in 1992 that there had been people after him with, quote, shooters. The investigators then found the two call recording machines in the couple's cottage that Harry had, again for unknown reasons, started using to record calls a few days before the murders. The details around these recording devices are a little bit confusing, so stick with me for this next section. On one of the tapes from one of the machines, the police found a recording of a message that contained a threat aimed at Harry for the following morning. Investigators were able to determine that this threatening message had been placed by a man who we'll call Mark for identity protection purposes. You see, Mark and Harry had actually had a fight back in October of 1992, around the same time that Harry and Nicola had moved into Blackman's cottage. 
Now, the prosecution in this case would claim that this message, which had been the last message on that tape, had been left in either October or November of 1992, months before Harry had started recording his calls. It could be said that Harry might have recorded calls previously, but had stopped, but it really isn't clear. Mark alleged that any contact between him and Harry had been severed by November of 1992, which was months before the murders. Though Nicola's mother told the police that she believed that a message on the tape that she had left had preceded the message left by Mark and had actually been left by her shortly before the murders. The police also learned in the course of their investigations that Mark had been the owner of an Audi motor car, which matched the description of the one seen by a witness on the day of the murders. Investigators, despite this, and in the name of due diligence, took a closer look at the relationships between Harry and other people to see what more they might find. One of these connections had been that Harry and a man who we'll call Henry for, again, identity protection purposes. Henry had previously had dealings with Harry concerning a BMW, which Henry believed to have been ringed, car ringing being a stolen car that has its identification replaced by a set from another car. And so Henry reported this to the police. The investigators then took a closer look at the relationship between Harry and Jonathan, who we spoke about earlier and who Harry had told the police five days before his murder had been giving him trouble. The police actually considered Jonathan to be sufficiently connected with the events of the case that he could be arrested on suspicion of murder, which he was, though he was subsequently released. Jonathan was known to have been a violent person, with witness accounts detailing of how he may have threatened people with shotguns. However, the police were satisfied that Jonathan hadn't been in the area at the time of the murders due to the locational data of his mobile phone, which placed him at a significant distance from the cottage at the time. Side note, they used a method of mobile phone positioning called triangulation and not GPS, which is where they use the connection strengths from three or more mobile phone masts to determine where exactly the phone had been. The investigators then turned their attention to a man called Stephen Young, who had business connections to Harry Fuller. On the 22nd of February 1993, two police officers paid Stephen a visit at his office in order to question him about his relation to Harry. Stephen told the authorities that his connection was that he, Stephen, had run an insurance broker's agency and that he had been in the process of obtaining business from Harry at the time of the murders and that he had actually known him for quite a while due to this business. Following this, the authorities decided to work with the BBC television show Crime Watch so that they could broadcast the recording of the phone call that Harry had taken the evening before the murders in which he had arranged a meeting with this unknown male for the following morning. They hoped that the publication of this audio might bring in some leads. Maybe somebody might recognize the voice. It was broadcast on the 15th of April, 1993, and it paid off. Two people contacted the authorities claiming to have recognized the voice in the phone call recording. None other than Stephen Young's neighbor and Stephen Young's sister-in-law. As a result of this, two days after the broadcast, Stephen Young voluntarily went to the police with a two-page statement that he had typed. In this statement, he claims that it had been his voice in the recording and that he had arranged this meeting with Harry as he had intended to sell him a Porsche motor car on behalf of an acquaintance. Stephen claimed to have arrived at the couple's cottage later than 8am due to roadworks, stating that he had arrived at about 8.20am. After arriving at the cottage, he claims that the curtains had been drawn and that Harry's Jaguar motor car hadn't been in the car park. Stephen stated that he knocked on the front door and was surprised to have not received any kind of response from inside the property. So Stephen apparently left for a short while before coming back and knocking on the door once more, but again, nobody responded. The statement goes on to say that he left at 8.40 a.m. and went back to his office as he had an appointment. Following this statement, the police arrested Stephen Young in connection to the case and subsequently interviewed him over a period of three days. Throughout these interviews, Stephen maintained his original statements, though included more detail. Most notably, the name of the person who he had the appointment with in the office that morning. The police focused their attention and their inquiries on Stephen Young in light of the information that he had provided. And they quickly learned that Stephen had actually lied in his interviews with the police and that he had actually been connected to the criminal underworld. Interestingly, investigators found bullets and cartridges inside Stephen's house that were identical to the ones found and used in the murder of Harry and Nicola. And importantly, they were able to establish a motive. 
This motive for the murder of the Fuller couple had been due to the fact that Stephen had been experiencing severe financial difficulties. CCTV footage was further uncovered by the authorities, which showed Stephen arriving considerably earlier than the 8.20am time that he had claimed in his statements and interviews, showing him arrive at 8.03am, and instead of leaving at 8.40am as he had claimed, it showed Stephen to have left at 9.10am. On top of this, they discovered a phone call that Stephen had made to Harry at 8.10am on the morning of the murders, which Stephen had neglected to inform the authorities about in either his statement or his interviews. Additional analysis of the bullets and cartridges determines the bullets to have been scored in an identical fashion to the ones found at the crime scene, and that the cartridges showed signs which indicated they had been fired from the same gun used in the murders. A closer search of Stephen's home uncovered a spent bullet, which was of a similar kind and which had been clearly discharged from the same gun used in the murders. They also found a modified Browning pistol under the bed of one of his children, which clearly hadn't been there for any legitimate purpose. Investigators explored the suspective motive for Stephen murdering Harry and Nicola, and they found that his financial position had been very precarious. Stephen had set up his own insurance broking business in 1986, though by the spring or summer of 1992, he had found himself extremely short of money due to him not handing over premiums that he had been receiving from his clients to the insurance companies, and instead pocketing the premiums for his own use. His mortgage had risen to £75,000, which he was behind on by £4,000. He had owed £5,500 and £6,500 on a personal loan, another £25,000 to his in-laws, and had other debts totalling £13,000. On top of that, he owed £40,000 to insurance companies due to him pocketing the premiums. And by February of 1993, the month of the murders, he was being chased by those insurance companies, and they all were requiring the payment of a significant sum of money by the end of February, or his agency with them would be terminated. The man that Stephen had an appointment with on the morning of the murders had actually been a representative from the provincial insurance company, and this man told the authorities that they had met after 10.30am that morning, and not at 9am as Stephen had claimed in his statements and interviews. Interestingly, at that meeting, Stephen handed this man a cheque for £6,000, which had been post-dated to the 11th of February 1993, so the next day. When the police took a closer look at Stephen's bank accounts, they discovered that on the 11th of February, he had deposited £6,000 in cash into his accounts and had further paid an outstanding post office bill for £330 in cash. All of this formed the essence of the trial against Stephen Young, which commenced in March of 1994. It must be noted that a, that a lot of money had been stolen from the Fuller Cottage and you know, this was the motive. This was what they what they thought Stephen's motive was based on. He had gone in, murdered them, and taken their money. Now, during this trial, Stephen gave an account of the events of the 10th of February 1993 that differed from the accounts he had given in his initial statement and subsequent interviews with the police. Let's take a look at how this account was described by the court documents. Quote, at the trial, his account was that, as far as the events of the 10th of February were concerned, he had in fact gone into the cottage. The circumstances he described in the following way. He had made his initial visit to the cottage and obtained no reply. He returned to the cottage, as he had previously described, but then had seen the back door ajar. He had gone into the cottage, and there he had seen Harry Fuller lying on the floor. He then left without having made any further investigation of what might have happened in that house. He accepted that the timings on the CCTV footage had been correct, in other words, that he had arrived at about 8.03am in Wadhurst and had left at about 9.09am, and he explains the fact that he had left so late because he had been concerned about what to do, having seen the body on the floor. He was concerned because he had sold to Harry Fuller a replica Walther PPK pistol which fired the sort of bullets that he considered could well have been used to kill Harry Fuller in January of 1990. He had not only sold him that pistol, but also bullets of the type which were found to have killed the Fullers. As he left the cottage, he saw a face in an upstairs window. 
He was unable to recognize the face. However, between the 10th of February and the time that he ultimately went to the police in April, he received three threatening phone calls, which he considered were clearly intended to frighten him, on the basis that the caller may have thought that he, Stephen, had recognized the face that he had seen at the window. Those threats did not merely involve Stephen, but also Stephen's family. He told the jury that he had returned from Wadhurst, the village where the couple lived, to a meeting with a representative from the provincial insurance company, which he had put at 9.30am or thereabouts, not as late as the representative has put it, and described how he handed over the cheque. As far as money was concerned, which was paid in the next day, that was money which had been saved up over a period, originally to pay off a debt he owed to somebody else. He denies that he was in such deep trouble financially that he was desperate to obtain money from any source. It was pure unhappy coincidence that he was there that fatal morning. He had no reason to kill the Fullers. The jury in Stephen's trial deliberated for six and a half hours after the four-week trial had come to an end. And on the 23rd of March 1994, they returned a unanimous verdict of guilty on two charges of murder for Harry and Nicola Fuller. Stephen Young subsequently was sentenced to two life sentences for the murders. Now, as I'm sure you're aware from the title of this video, this is not where this case ends. And in fact, something so beyond bizarre and unheard of took place during this jury's deliberations. The sentencing and justice served seem to have been a success, and the legal process of sending Stephen to prison to serve his sentence had swung into motion. The Fuller's families and friends could finally find some kind of closure and move forward. At least that's what they believed and hoped. Just one month after the trial had come to a close, on the 24th of April 1994, a headline plastered the front page of the newspaper The News of the World, appearing completely out of the blue. Quote, Murder Jury's Ouija Board Verdict. The article goes on to state, the murder trial jurors who used a Ouija board before reaching their verdict held the seance after a bowdy booze up, says the colleague who blew the whistle on them. But this seemingly out of the blue article hadn't actually been the first time that the Crown Court had heard these allegations. In fact, earlier that same week, on Tuesday the 19th of April 1994, the Crown Court received a three-page handwritten letter dated for the day previous. The contents of this letter have never been made public, but the article in the tabloids made it clear what it contained. I must quickly say that the book The Ouija Board Jurors, Mystery, Mischief and Misery in the Jury System by Jeremy Gans has been pivotal in my coverage of this case, and you can find a link to it in my sources. We're going to be taking a look at some of the extracts from this book and also some extracts from the court documents relating to what happened with the jury. A further headline smeared across the tabloid that read, booze, dirty jokes, and then the Ouija board. It alleged that some of the jurors had been drinking together at the hotel bar, and somehow the talk of seances came up. Further, some jurors allegedly told some off-colour jokes, but those jokes would be the least of their troubles. The article goes on to detail a letter that had been penned by a member of the jury called Adrian. Quote, I just couldn't live with myself. To me, this was a miscarriage of justice. I thought to myself, this is someone's life we're dealing with. I was astonished that these grown-up people had played this child's game. You see, Adrian had been the youngest member of the jury at the trial, and he had apparently spent countless sleepless nights after the verdict, quotes, lying awake at night thinking about it, and even dreaming about Harry Fuller. Adrian decided that he should talk to his parents, which then afterwards he talk, spoke with the Citizens Advice Bureau, who then advised him to go speak with a solicitor. This is his account of what happened over the deliberation period. There had been 12 jurors on the trial, and when they retired to consider their verdict on the 22nd of March 1994, they had been unable to reach a decision that day, and so were accommodated overnight at a local hotel to return the next day to continue their deliberations. But that night at the hotel, when the talk of seances came up, Adrian stated that he had been interested to hear what they said. Quote, I was interested to hear what they said, but found it funny. Those who had done it before were laughing about it, but those who hadn't were quite serious. We had a curfew of 11pm and had to be in our rooms before then. I went 10 minutes early because I had three pints and was quite tipsy. Another woman had a headache and went to bed early. I didn't get a good night's sleep because I'd drunk too much and felt a bit rough and the bed wasn't too comfortable. 
One of the jury produced two pieces of paper and started talking about the previous night. I overheard and at first couldn't believe it. They had secretly gone to one of their rooms and gone through with it. I didn't think anything else about Ouija boards until the next morning when it was raised again halfway through breakfast. The 12 of us on the jury and the two court bailiffs were sitting around a long table. He just came out with it and said, we've done a Ouija board and got in contact with Harry and Nicola. He said he and three female jurors went to one of their rooms that had a few drinks and just decided to do it. Of course, following the receipt of this letter, an investigation was launched. They firstly had to determine whether or not the court could even look into the matter at all, and if so, how far they could do so. This was due to Section 8 of the Contempt of Court Act of 1981, which states, It is a contempt of court to obtain, disclose, or solicit any particulars of statements made, opinions expressed, arguments advanced, or votes cast by members of a jury in the course of their deliberations in any legal proceedings. This does not apply to any disclosure of any particulars, a, in the proceedings in question for the purpose of enabling the jury to arrive at their verdict, or in connection with the delivery of that verdict, or b, in evidence in any subsequent proceedings for an offence alleged to have been committed in relation to the jury in the first mentioned proceedings, or to the publication of any particulars so disclosed. Essentially, what happens in the room when the jury are deliberating stays in that room, and the courts aren't allowed to know any details bar their verdict, unless the jury needs assistance in arriving at their verdict, or if they have committed an offence whilst making their deliberations. The courts had to figure out to what extent they could find out what had happened with the jury. It was concluded that, predominantly based on the facts that the jurors are required to be kept together during all deliberations, and that jurors must not continue the deliberations at the hotel, which they had been told by the judge. The courts were entitled to inquire into what happened at the hotel, but not as to what happened thereafter in the jury room. It was ordered that affidavits be collected from each of the 12 jurors and from the two bailiffs that had been looking after them at the hotel. The Treasury solicitor, in conjunction with the senior police officer, took charge of the inquiry. The affidavits collected did have some difference of detail, but they gave what the courts described as a reasonably clear and consistent account of what had occurred in the hotel. After dinner, there had been a conversation amongst some of the jurors about Ouija boards. One of the bailiffs apparently spoke out strongly against them, as did a lady juror, and the other bailiff agreed, saying, quote, not to be so stupid. At around 11pm that night, the bailiffs moved the jurors to their rooms. Thereafter, it is clear that four jurors, the four men and three women, got together in the room of one of the women. A Ouija board was then set up. I'm sure most of you know what a Ouija board is, but just in case, it's a board used at a seance to seek messages from the spirits of absent or deceased persons. In this case, there hadn't been a formal Ouija board present, and so letters of the alphabet were printed on scraps of paper and a glass was used as a pointer. The jurors present then put a finger on the glass, which then moved towards a succession of letters, thereby perpetrating to reveal a message. It's interesting to note that the court documents detail that at least some of those present only began this procedure as a joke or a harmless prank. After perpetrating to receive messages from persons known or related to two of the jurors, one of which had been deceased, the following occurred according to one of the jurors that had been present. Ray, who was one of the jurors present, the foreman, then asked, quote, is anyone there? The glass went to yes. Ray said, who is it? The glass spelled out, Harry Fuller. When I say the glass spelt it out, I mean it went to each letter. I realised Harry Fuller was the subject of the evidence we were hearing. Ray said, who killed you? The glass spelt out Stephen Young, done it. Ray said, how? The glass spelt, shot. Ray said something else, and the glass spelt shotgun and pistol. Ray said, where is the gun? The glass spelt police. Ray also asked who killed Nicola, and the glass spelled out Stephen Young. Ray then cut out paper and put the numbers 0 to 10 on them, and put them in an inner circle. The alphabet was on an outer circle. Previously, Ray had asked the motive, and the glass had spelt out money. Ray asked where it was, and the glass spelt case. He then asked how much had been taken, and the glass spelt out 63,000. Ray asked where the money was now, and the glass spelt out bag. Ray asked where, and the glass spelt out, Harry Brinklow, room above office. We then discussed among ourselves what we should do, and the glass spelt out, tell police. I said we can't. It then spelt out, later, us and you. It continued, vote guilty tomorrow. 
During this time, Ray made notes. It is only right to say I was crying by this time and the other ladies were upset as well. We realized it had gone too far and we ended the exercise. Ray threw the paper away. We retired to our rooms and agreed not to relate what we'd done to anyone. Contrary to that agreement, the jurors did discuss the seance at breakfast the following morning with the other jurors who had not been present. On top of this, more than one of the jurors admitted that they had too much to drink and had been feeling worse for it the next morning. Neither of the bailiffs appeared to have been aware of that, uh, or the fact that the four of the jurors had met up in one room over a Ouija board in the middle of the night. The inquiry and the court had several questions to answer before they could move forward. Had it been merely a drunken game which the court should disregard? The three women jurors who had been at the seance had become very upset about it. One was crying and had taken the view that it had gone too far. Further, why, if it was just a game, had these three women had these reactions? And why, when the verdict had been unanimous, had one juror, who hadn't been at the seance, been so concerned that they consulted a solicitor and made a statement about what had happened? The inquiry concluded by stating that after considering all the circumstances, they found that there was a real danger that what occurred during this misguided Ouija session may have influenced some jurors and may thereby have prejudiced Stephen Young. And for those reasons, a retrial was ordered in October of 1994. This retrial commenced on the 21st of November 1994 and lasted five weeks, concluding on the 11th of December 1994. And Stephen Young was found guilty of the murders again, receiving the same sentencing of life imprisonment on each count concurrently. Appeals were filed, but nothing much came of them and they were dismissed. Stephen Young's minimum term was set at 20 years, less than 11 months and 5 days that he'd spent on remand. Nicola's father told the media that the Ouija jurors had made a complete joke of his daughter's death, and I completely agree. The level of detachment from reality those jurors showed was beyond disrespectful and downright disgusting. I'm glad, though, that justice prevailed in this case, and as far as I can tell, no formal charges have actually been brought against those jurors who took part in the Ouija board readings. They all denied convicting Stephen Young on the basis of what the Ouija board had said and had described it as just being a joke. But whatever the case, we can only hope that both Harry and Nicholas' families and friends have been able to find closure and move forward with their lives, keeping their loved ones close to heart. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. You can find a link to grab your one month free trial in the description and in the pinned comment. A special thank you to my following Patreon and channel members for your support on this episode. Lady Janice Mimi Fisher, Kirsty Jade G, Patricia Luna, Casey Monks, Samantha O'Hara, Cicely Thomas, Bella Mephius, Nino Lover, MG, Bailey's Clubhouse, and Katie from the other side. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description, along with my social media, if you wanted to join me there too. You can also find me on Twitch, where every Saturday at 10pm UK time, which is 5pm Eastern and 2pm Pacific, we dive deep into True Crime Cases live. So you can find all those links down below. With all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. A special thank you to all of my Patreon members for helping keep this channel afloat, but especially thank you to my lead investigators for all of your support. If you'd like to support this channel for less than $5 a month, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash it's Joshua Miles. For less than $5 a month, you'll get early access to videos and access to scripts and also polls on cases. If you or someone you know has been affected by issues covered in our programming, including this episode, then please use the link in the description for information, advice and support.